Now, new research suggests that the type of bacteria in your gut can affect whether you put on weight or stay slim. Scientists have been looking at why some people can eat, say, chocolate and ice cream and not put on weight. Others do the same and pile on the pounds. And it seems that our gut bacteria influence the way that our body responds to food and everyone's works slightly differently. And the theory goes that by analysing your gut bacteria, you can then come up with your own personalised diet, which can help you lose weight. And of course, that means you can then fight off diabetes type 2, Alzheimer's maybe, and so on. And here to tell us more about these tiny creatures living inside us and how they can help us become healthier is Dr. Michael Mosley. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Hi there. Well, this is interesting. And I suppose this has come partly from this research involving identical twins, hasn't it, who did the same exercise and ate the same stuff but had different weight gain. That's right, um, because typically identical twins have uh, a similar weight, but in some cases they don't. And so people got really interested in why is this true? And one of the things they found is that there were a different mix of gut bacteria. They also did this thing with mice uh, where they get mice um, at birth, they bring them out, they make sure they're not exposed to any bugs, and so they are effectively sterile. They have no bacteria in their gut. And then they feed them poo samples uh, from people, humans, who are either overweight or slim, and see what happens and typically what happens is that the mice um, will become fatter if they're fed poo from a fat person and become stay slim if they're fed uh, poo from a slim person. Right. <laughs> we well, suggest there's something in there. I'm just when I hear a story like that, I'm so glad I'm not a mouse. <laughs> the yeah. so so we if we're looking at variables, then then gut bacteria is is a good place, is it? That's that's what it makes the difference. Absolutely, because people thought it was all about genetics, then they thought it was all about environment, but now it's very clear that your gut bacteria play a huge part. It's been very difficult to study bacteria in your gut until now, although there are, you know, trillions in there, uh, about uh, four pounds weight, I think they estimate around 30 uh, trillion bacteria in your gut. Four pounds? Wow. About four pounds of bacteria in your gut, uh, two kilos. And uh, they were very difficult to study because most of them won't grow outside your body. But what they were able to do relatively recently is they're able to look at the DNA and um, from your poo samples, they can actually tell you the mix. I had it done a couple of years ago, so I know the mix of bacteria in my gut. All right, well, we, we can hear that this uh, <laughs> moment when you're on this BBC4 documentary, Michael, and a camera has been interestingly shoved up your nose. So I guess it does a U-turn at some point. It's really and, painful. Yeah, I, do you know I had that once? It was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, and it's watching your own digestive system break down a meal of steak and chips. Let's hear this. You can see the way the food is being churned up by muscles in my stomach wall. As well as this mashing action, my stomach is also releasing gastric juices and began doing so long before I started eating. Gastric juices are released at the sight, smell or even thought of food. And the powerful chemicals they contain will help turn these lumps of food into a creamy mush known as chime. Oh, nice. But I don't think I can bear having this camera down here any longer. Coming back. Oh, that's horrible. Wacky nose. Oh, horrible, 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 horrible. So why can't they just put the camera straight down your throat, by the way? Well, what they did, actually, in this case, I'd swallowed a pill camera as well. And so the pill camera was down in my gut, and I was kind of manoeuvring it around with a magnet, uh, and <laughs> as what does. So the pill camera takes pictures, about four or five pictures a second, and this is then transmitted to a uh, outside. So I was actually then in the Science Museum, and it was projected up on a huge screen, and uh, uh, five or 600 people were watching uh, the contents of my stomach at the time. And then they fed a, a nasogastric tube down, uh, into my gut so they could look at um, pictures from different angles. So I had two cameras broadcasting the contents of my intestines at the same time. Now, one of the things we've heard about gut bacteria is that if you take a lot of antibiotics, they can kill them off, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So I, I, my only understanding of gut bacteria is we kind of need them. We do, and we need a huge range of them, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the bad thing about having... Uh, antibiotics is that they will knock them off. There is also, you are sort of effectively sterile until the moment you come out of, you start to come down your mother's vagina and what you do is you swallow her poo sample. Um, so if you're well, that's the start of it, is it? That's the start of it. Before that, you're 100% human. And then when you come out, you're about 50% human. Tr- um, Tracy Barnett has just tweeted, <laughs> my lunch isn't so tasty now. <laughs> Sorry, Tracy. 
But now, crucially, you, you get good gut bacteria and bad gut get bacteria. And how do I get bacteria in my gut that enables me to eat unlimited chocolate? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, quite a bit of it is genetic. There are very few people who are able to do that. Um, and um, they have a particularly subsection of bacteria. And it seems that they can afford to live relatively unhealthy lives. Most of us, that's not true. Uh, I think one of the things you're alluding to is some research which was done in Israel. And what they did there is they got people uh, essentially to wear these glucose monitors. One of my colleagues, Dr. Sally Hassan, went down there and she had these. And you wear them pretty constantly for seven days. And what they do is they feed you different foods and see what effect that has on your blood glucose levels. And the assumption was that we would all respond to the same foods in the same way. If you ate grapes, if you ate chocolate, you'd get this big spike in uh, sugar levels followed by a spike in your insulin. This was generally a bad thing. But what they'd discovered in Israel is if you look at about 1,000 people, they, uh, some people respond a lot and some people respond not at all. And what they found is it um, is largely down to the mix of gut bacteria. And the same thing is true, for example, of artificial sugars, uh, that I could feed you artificial sugars and me artificial sugars and you might respond quite badly to them and I would not respond at all to them um, and that seems to be entirely down to the mix of gut bacteria. I, I had a diet coke yesterday, a can of it, which I don't often do and as I drank it I thought I know, uh, and obviously other, other diet Pepsis are available but I, I thought I, I know that my body, I can't con my body here <laughs> I'm certain that it's responding to the fake sugar in the way that it responds to the real sugar. I just have a feeling. Am I right? Yeah, sort of, because one of the things that happens is it hits the taste buds in your mouth and your brain then goes, great, sugar's on its way. And one of the things it'll do is it'll release insulin, which um, will bring your sugar levels down. And if you don't get sugar coming into your system at that point, all that happens is the insulin will make your sugar levels go down even further and probably make you feel hungrier. Okay. Certainly the research seems to suggest that people who uh, have, you know, drinks which have lots of artificial sweeteners in them, they actually eat more and they tend to put on weight. It's not actually a great way of losing weight. OK. So th you, the, the Tel Aviv research, the Israel research you mentioned, had the amazing, amazing upshot that one person can get fat from eating ice cream, but another person can get fatter from eating grapes. <laughs> yes. I don't understand that. OK, so it wasn't, in fact, to do with fatness. It was to do with the effect on your blood glucose levels because what you don't want is a big sugar surge because that tends to be associated with things like type 2 diabetes. You don't want to have constant spikes in your blood glucose levels. So that's what they found is they found that you could eat grapes and it would have very little effect on your system whereas I could eat grapes and I'd get a great big spike and, and, and sorry, vice my, versa with ice cream. Understood. My reason for saying, um, to, talking about being fat is that my, you, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, Michael, but my understanding is that you get fat because you eat sugar and it gives a signal to your body to store. So it, yes. am I right to use that shorthand? Yes, that's broadly true, though also it's down to the amount of calories you eat. And the thing about, say, ice cream is because it has a lot of fat in it, the fat binds the sugar. And that means that when you eat it, um, it's actually what they call the GI index is relatively low, uh, which is surprising. Uh, and that's one of the complexities. Uh, if you just ate the sugar from the ice cream, then your blood glucose levels would soar upwards. But because the fat is bound to it, it slows the absorption. Option. So from that point of view, ice cream is not so bad for you as eating the equivalent amount of pure sugar, although it will obviously be fattening because it does still have the fat and the sugar and your body's going to absorb them. Uh, it, and that is why the world of nutrition is so wonderfully, wonderfully All right. complex. I'm going to play some, some music in a sec. Why, why is it, if I think of a bar of chocolate, I want to eat it. If I think of sticky toffee pudding, I want to eat it. If I think of a teaspoon of sugar, just just plain white sugar. I don't want to put that in my mouth. Why is that? I think it is to do largely also, there's a sort of pleasure point. It's the mixture of sugar and fat. There are very few um, pure sugar foods out there. Uh, mainly they're mixed with something else and the manufacturers have been incredibly clever in the way they've manipulated the ratios and they've tested them on humans, on rats, on everything, so that we will just go on scoffing it. We see that toffee pudding, we know <laughs> we want it. We know it's bad for us and then we eat it. All right, we're talking about gut bacteria here with Dr. Michael Mosley, 0500 288 291, if you would like to ask about yours, about whether you can change it, maybe. To process food. And, and therefore, we all want to have fast metabolisms, do we? 
Uh, so because because if you if you have a fast one, I'm um, assuming as a layman, then the food goes in, you process it really quickly, and 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 you stay thin. Yeah, no, I mean that's um, the kind of goal and the promise, and lots of um, things out there claiming to speed up your metabolism, very few of which actually do. So but when you when they say when you're in a doctor's surgery, it's the pers- the thinnest person is the one who's gone through all the magazines because <laughs> they're just constantly moving. Yes, no, you burn an awful lot of calories just by twitching and moving around and sort of standing up and down things like that. My wife is very slim and she's constantly on the go. But but those people, not your wife, but they are very annoying. <laughs> they're My wife's stop. quite annoying. They, in they, that they, respect, they're yeah. distracted easily. Yeah, no, completely. They roam around. They your stay wife is slim. quite annoying. <laughs> she, she eats lots of food and um, doesn't appear to put on weight. Yeah, so, yeah. well, so, so how do we... I, I've probably told you before that I had this overactive thyroid 15 years ago, which turned me into one of those people. And I, then I got cured, you know, and I really, really regret being cured <laughs> from it because actually it's a very useful illness that if it's in moderation because you become one of those twitchy people. It is. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to train yourself to do it. I mean, you can uh, increase your metabolic rate by basically standing up every so often. Um, that standing up, you burn three times as many calories as you do sitting down. Uh, if you go for a walk, if you run up the stairs, if you do anything like that, that will temporarily raise your metabolic rate. Uh, there's but lots of promises about foods, but to be honest, not many of them have much effect. But you can't you can't become somehow the person who, I bet this is your wife, you cross and uncross your legs 15 times more than anybody else. I've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a little experiment which I attempted to increase my metabolic rate by deliberately twitching. And really? You, you just... You you just can't, you know, you you forget. <laughs> I set my thing and it bleeped to me every 10 minutes and told me to twitch more. I just... <laughs> no, it's, and also you're a happy guy. You see, the cat, the cat sits on me. My wife's theory is that's because I sit down more than she does. <laughs> I think because the cat likes me. Yeah, no, I'm just moving all the time. I'm still, I've still got a bit of that thyroid thing, I think. Gary is in Barnsley and he says, what do probiotic drinks do for gut bacteria? Because they promise a lot, don't they? They do promise a lot and the evidence is pretty dodgy, and unfortunately. Uh, the idea is that you're sort of pumping these bacteria bacteria um, from your drink into it and it's all going to sort of balance things out. The trouble is that you have a lot of acid in your stomach which will knock out 95% of them and then when they get down to the gut, the gut is already colonised by a few trillion other bacteria who are going to fight them off. Um, so uh, not very convinced. I'm not convinced by the evidence I've seen so far that any probiotic is going to make a great deal of difference. If we discover that there are some types of gut bacteria that you want, and here I come back to the mm. key question, can you have in the future, a gut bacteria transplant? You can already. Uh, there is a condition called Clostridium difficile, which is... We know about really that. Un- yeah, really the unpleasant. hospital infection, yeah. Absolutely, hospital infection. If you get in the gut, it persists. You then find yourself going for a poo every sort of 10 minutes or so. Uh, you can't really... You can blast it with antibiotics. It doesn't have much effect. But what they do now is what's called a faecal transplant. Um, I've watched one of those. And what they do is they take a poo sample from somebody who's healthy, they liquidise it, and they give it to you via a nasogastric tube. And I've seen somebody effectively cured within about 25 minutes. Is that one of those ones where the illness is not as bad as the cure? No, the, <laughs> if you have it, actually, I mean, you know, I would certainly have it if I'd had, if I had that condition. But they're exploring its use now in other things. And there's actually a bank now because um, you get paid, I think, in the US $10 a, ma- a sample. Really? Uh, yep. So you could go and give a sample. You have to be screened to make sure you have a good mix of bacteria. But uh, yeah. OK, uh, Andy, Andy Smullyan is in Hen Street and he asks also the great question of the day. How do I get my gut bacteria tested? He says he's asked his doctor who said, oh, I'm sorry, that's very difficult. Uh, you can go to something called British Gut. If you look at American Gut or British Gut, they're both um, uh, effectively charities. British Gut is run by King's College. Uh, it will cost you about 75 quid, I think, which is a kind of donation towards the cause. Uh, but they will give you a sort of full rundown. Just go to the website and it'll tell you all you want to know. But will the answer be comprehensible to a, a, uh, they an ordinary you, mortal? They give you some sort of um, breakdown, so hopefully. OK. I hope that's useful. So British gut, Andy. Uh, let's see. Chris emails, could the gut bacteria prevent me gaining weight? I'm 35. I'm 75 kilos. That sounds quite light. I'm 1.85 metres. I'm consuming an average of 3,100 calories per day. I'm weight training three times a week, four times a week. Can't gain any mass. You want to put on weight? Well, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. OK. Blimey. So will it help you put on mass? Wow. Uh, Just turn 45. That's the way to do it. <laughs> 
I don't know. I imagine that um, the best way, if you really wanted to do it, would be to increase the intake of protein and probably fat in this instance, because fat is much more energy dense. Uh, I don't often come across people who really want to put on weight. No, I don't. I'd, I'd love to talk to Chris because I don't know what possible purpose there could be. I think he might mean muscle. I think he means muscle. He wants to go on the beach and not have sand kicked in his face. Yeah, I mean, broadly, that's about protein. But again, you don't want to be um, consuming more than about 120 grams protein a day. Mm. So, so basically, someone comes to you and says, look, I want to put on weight. You'd ask them some questions. I would. It's yeah. quite a complex story. And also he could he could put on the wrong kind of weight around yeah, his stomach. Right. Which is not good. Which wouldn't be good. That's quite easy to do, actually. There's certain beers we can recommend here. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky Shinkins in Banbury. Hi, Vicky. Hello there. Now, you've got the opposite problem of our last guy. You're, you're, you think your gut doesn't really break down fats. No, I've got a condition called um, sphincter of body dysfunction type 2 and um, pancreatic division. Um, and I am on the toilet all day, every day. I can be up there, sat on the toilet for half an hour, come down and I have to go straight back up there. Um, and my consultant seems to think that my body doesn't break down fat because when I go to the loo, it floats and there is the most awful, awful stench. But he says he thinks it. my body is just not breaking down fat. And what what was the name of the, of the condition you mentioned? It's sphincter of body type 2 dysfunction and pancreatic divism. Okay. So basically your pancreas isn't pumping out enough uh, enzyme to break down the fat by the sounds of things. Which is what they think, yes. Yeah, yeah. I've had to do all sorts of samples and everything. But And I find it really difficult. I don't... I average weight-wise, but I find it really difficult to lose weight. I eat healthy. I mean, I've got a Fitbit. I'm doing an average of 25,000 steps a day, so I'm on the go all the time. But I find it really, really hard to lose weight. Unfortunately, losing weight is more about changing your diet than the exercise. Exercise is great, but someone described it as being like Batman and Robin. Unfortunately, Batman is the food. Uh, that's the major component. Um, so has, have they given you an advice on diet? Because that's obviously uh, what you probably need to do in your circumstances. Yeah, no, diet is fine. I mean, I eat healthily. Um, I eat three meals, you know, it's an average of three meals a day. I go to the gym two or three times a week. As I say, I'm on the go constantly. Been to see a dietitian. They said everything's fine. Try and cut down as much of the fatty foods as I can. But other than that, I'm just stumped. Really. Could Vicky could Vicky get a gut bacteria transplant that you describe, Michael? I think it, not at this stage, unfortunately, because it's still relatively experimental. So there are only a few conditions that it's um, uh, permitted, of which this um, condition called Clostridium difficile is. I mean, it seems unlikely you've obviously been tested that you have anything like that. So I'm afraid I'm a little bit stumped. OK, Vicky, thank you for your call. I hope that's helpful, just, just to have us conjure with it here. Let's see, John text. What about babies born via caesarean section? How do they acquire? gut bacteria? Interesting question because what they know now is that um, there are some long-term complications with being born by caesarean and actually what they're doing in New York in the hospital there is they're running a trial where they take a swab from the mother's bottom and they wipe the lips of the newborn baby who's been delivered by caesarean section to give her, a, you know, give the child a decent old, um, you know, yeah. Mouthful. I hear you. Ian Stephen in Peterhead says, I would like to thank Michael for his excellent book about cutting sugar from your diet. We talked about that last time yep. you were here, Michael. As a result of reading it, I have cured myself of type 2 diabetes. Yep. No, I've had loads of people um, who, after the programme, um, took it up and um, have done the same. So, uh, R- remind uh, us, uh, Sorry, I should, I should have had the book here, but just remind us of the title. It's called um, The Eight-Week Blood Sugar Diet, and basically it's about how you can reverse your diabetes in eight weeks. Thank you very much indeed, Dr Michael Mosley.